I don't know if any of you noticed, but the uh, strings were having a little adversity there just for a minute. Did anybody notice that? No? No? Anyway, that's good. That's good. That's good because we're actually talking about adversity today. And I thought, how appropriate. They weren't even clued in to what we were going to discuss or talk, and boom, they just fit right into the schedule. So I don't know exactly what happened, but... <laughs> All right, well, we're glad you're here. I'll tell you what, just think about the words of that song just for a moment. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. You know, the more we can approach days like that, I mean, especially, I always feel that way, I may, always is maybe a little overstatement. Most of the time I feel that way about Sabbath. I love Sabbath. Sabbath is like the best day of the week for me. I hope it's the best day of the week for you. I can tell you it hasn't always been that way for me. When I was younger, I had this love-hate relationship with Sabbath because I was raised uh, as a Seventh-day Adventist and there was a lot of do's and don'ts about the Sabbath and I didn't, and I kind of, that rubbed me the wrong way. I don't know if any of you ever have that experience, but uh, I think sometimes we can't understand things so super well when we're young. And maybe they're not even presented to us the right way when we're young. You know, perhaps. But I'd like to start with prayer and then we'll get into our message today, okay? So let's, let's bow our heads. Lord, we are so grateful that we are here today. Because when it really comes down to it, today is really all we're promised. We don't know for sure what tomorrow brings. But we can be assured that you give us today and that ultimately, whatever happens tomorrow, we can be okay with because you are our God and you are our friend. So we just invite in a special way your Holy Spirit here to reach and touch our hearts and minds about a very, in my mind, can be a challenging topic. Um, and I just ask for your help to guide and direct our time together um, so that maybe we can leave here with something that can help us, um, not just today, but tomorrow as well. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, glad you're here. Just a special call out. I know there's several people who are here I haven't seen in a while, but a special call out to Jeremy, my friend Jeremy. I'm glad to see you, Jeremy. I know you've kind of been through it a bit here lately, and we're glad you're back. So good to see you. Um, okay, slides. 20 questions. All right, so here's what we're going to do. I'm trying to figure out how we do this. I'm going to ask for a volunteer from each section. Okay, a volunteer from each section. And I want you to be a volunteer who's played the game 20 questions. If you don't know what the game 20 questions is, don't volunteer, okay? But if, you're a vol if you know what 20 questions is and how to play the game 20 questions, I'd love for you to volunteer. So who from this section over here would like to be a volunteer? Okay, Sharla, thank you. Could you stand up, please? Very good. We're gonna need a mic for Sharla. Could we get a mic for Sharla? Could somebody get a mic for Sharla, please? In fact, we're going to need four mics. Okay, I have two up here you can use as well if you need it. Here we go. Sorry about that. Okay, so who would like to be a volunteer from this group? This section right here. We just need one volunteer. Just one volunteer. Who would like to be the one? Oh, by the way, I should, I should mention one thing. I, I, the volunteer does need to be somebody over 30 years old. Okay, so Charlotte, are you over 30? Okay, very good. All right. Who's a volunteer here? Nancy, did you volunteer? Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Nancy. I appreciate the volunteer. <laughs> Nobody's volunteering there. I'm going to have to assign somebody, okay? Who's, who would like to volunteer from this section? If you've got to be over 30 years old, who would like to volunteer? It's, not, it's just 20 questions, guys. It's not that, okay. <laughs> volunteer, just one volunteer. Okay, all right. Well, this should be interesting. Why okay. All right, and then we have a volunteer from this section. <laughs> I need somebody over the age of 30 to volunteer. Okay, Jose, thank you, Jose. All right, if, for, if all the volunteers, would you just stand up? Just, 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 you don't have to come up here, just stand up. Just stand up, okay, so 20 questions. So just to review the game real quick, 
20 questions means you get to keep asking questions as long as you get a yes answer from me. If I say no to you, then it goes to the next person, right? So if we'll start with you, Charlotte. You get to ask a question. If I say no, it goes to Nancy. If I, you, you keep going until, you get, until we find out who the person is, okay? So I'm giving you a clue. I am a person, okay? I mean, not me personally. It's not me. It's a, it's a person, okay? All right, okay, Charla, you want to start? Have you played this game before? Yes. Okay, very good. All right, go ahead. Is this person a female? No. Okay. Stay, still stand, because we may come back to you. Okay. Okay, is this person a male? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, the person's a male. Is you said that if it's a yes, you stay there. Oh, oh, yes, yes, Nancy, sorry, I'm sorry. I haven't played the game before. I haven't played the game. Is this a Bible character? No. Okay. Is this a person from history? Uh, from history, like, are they not? Uh, American history. Yes, yes. Is he a scientist? A scientist, no. Is he alive? No. No, he's not. A, he asked if he was alive. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure about this one. Okay, no. Oh, Charla. It's hard to do the yes, no questions. Hang on. Wait. Do we know this person? What, what does that mean? Have you heard of this person before? Is that what you're saying? Have we heard of this person? Is that your question? Yes. Yes. I mean, have heard of this I mean, have we heard of this person in the last 10 years? So, Ask another question. That, that, that depends. I would say, I could say yes, and I could say no to that, so. Is this person Jesus? No, the person's not in the Bible. Oh, I forgot that answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, did you, was that a question? This is no, this person's not Jesus. Okay, we'll go to Nancy, go ahead. Is anybody is keeping track of the 20 questions? Eight. Huh? This is question eight. Okay, good. I'm not. Okay, good. Is this person a musician? No. I, I, I mean, they may have some musical talent, but I don't think that they're known for having really much. Yeah, okay. Is this person a Christian? So was this person a Christian? I'm not sure. I don't know the answer to that. You want to ask another question? Don't count that question. Okay, go ahead. we won't count that one. I'm not sure the answer on that. Was he American? Yes. Was he from church, Adventist church? No, he's not from the Adventist church, okay. Question number 11. Okay. Was he a president? No. Or is he a president? No. Is this person a family father? No. Is this person related to you? No. <laughs> Is he a teacher? Are you defining someone who actually taught professionally as a, as a professional? In, uh, Is that the question? Books. I'm pardon? Uh, has he written books? Oh, well, now that's a different question. Which question do you want me? Was, was he a teacher like, uh, was famous because in history because he was a writer or? I, well, now see, you're asking more than one question there. I'm gonna assume, I'll go with the first one. Was he a teacher? I'm assuming you meant like, was he a paid professional teacher? No, okay. What is? <clears throat> Is he a criminal? No, I can see we're gonna to have to make this 40 questions, apparently. Okay, go ahead. How many questions was that? Is this that? person a philosopher? They know the answer, so they can't play. Um, 
Was this person a philosopher? I would say yes. You get to go again. I mean, you might, don't, don't go too deep into that, but I, I will answer the question, yes, okay. I already tried the time period thing, it didn't work, I guess. Um, I okay, five seconds. Okay, the, is this person from the 1980s? The 1980s? No. Was this person a political person? Do you mean was this person a paid professional politician? No, I'm, it's, it's kind of important to the, I, I'm just, is yes, is that your question? No, okay. Was he, uh, he made some changes in history that we know. No, I'd probably, like was he an inventor or something like that? Was, was that what you something mean? Something in that change how we live now. Prop, no, I would say no. Jose, what number of question are we on? 20. Okay, good, you're running. That's a yes, I keep going, right? Yeah, yeah, you, I'll let you keep going. Is, it, is this person in your sermon? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Would I want to sit next to this person? Yes. Okay. Uh, is the person in this room? No, no, the person's dead. Oh, I missed that question. Okay, so I still go. Okay, to okay. Um, Am I the only person listening to these questions? No, so go, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> Is, is this person buried in, is this person buried in California? I, I don't think so, no. I would say no. Okay. All right, good. So that's 20 questions. So it's for the sake of time, I'm going to have to move on. I was hoping that would pan out a little better than it did. Um, I will give you, I'm going to give you some clues now, okay? So if somebody, st I'll give you clues, and so if somebody thinks they knew who it is, let you raise your hand, okay? All right. All right. And I better be pretty obvious. This person was born in Oklahoma. Pardon? Will Rogers. Bingo, Will Rogers, exactly. Okay, so now I don't know, okay? So here's, Will, here's a picture of Will Rogers. He was a cowboy, a humorist, a movie star, a political pundit, and he was also a native of Oklahoma. Now, some of you, how many of you have never heard of Will Rogers? Raise your hand if you've never heard of Will Rogers. Now you may have heard of Will Rogers in the sense that the airport in Oklahoma City is called the Will Rogers World Airport. It was named after him, okay? He was a native Oklahoman. Imagine, believe it or not, the airport's named after him. For some of you who maybe don't know, Will Rogers actually died in a plane crash with another Oklahoman, I think he was Oklahoman, Wiley Post. Um, and that was actually back in 1935. But just to give you a couple ideas, Will Rogers in the early 30s, okay, was the highest paid movie star in the world. Now, granted, what kind of movies were they making back in 1930? Not a whole lot. But this guy was very, 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 very famous at this time. He, he wrote uh, newspaper columns. He was, he was like somebody who you would think of that was very, very well known. And he's amazing in, in probably a variety of ways, but today I want to focus on a couple things. One is I want to share with you a saying. He, he, he was a very, he was a philosopher in the sense that he was very philosophical about a lot of different things. And he would come up with little sayings and phrases and quotes that had like, hmm, made you kind of think twice about it. And here's one of them, okay? This is a quote of his. The worst thing that happens to you may be the best thing for you if you don't let it get 
the best of you. Think about that for a second. Now, I can tell you that I don't want you to get too hung up on everything. I want, you, I want you to look at the second line, though. It says, may be the best thing. It doesn't mean it absolutely is the best thing. It's emphatically the best thing. We're going to talk a little more about that a little, little later in the sermon. But I, I want to just don't dig too deep on this. But I want us to think, is this, I want us to ask this question. Is that true? Is it true? And let's put it to the test. And we're going to do that right now. And you're going to have an opportunity. <clears throat> I'm trying to figure out how to couch this so that you guys believe that this is a wonderful opportunity that you have. Because most of the time, most of you don't feel like it's much of an opportunity, right? But what we're going to do is we're going to have an opportunity to get into groups of three, okay? You're going to have an opportunity to get into groups of three. And I want you to think of this opportunity of being, get in a group with someone that you at least one person in the group you're not related to, okay? At least one person in the group you're not related to. So it might be easy for some of you, it might be a little more challenging. If you need to, I would encourage you to stand up, walk across the entire sanctuary, and find somebody who fits your, that profile. You with me? Okay, ideally it would be nice if you could be in groups of three. Groups of three, okay? One, two, three, okay. All right, here's our question, all right. I want you to discuss two Bible characters who experienced severe adversity, but it turned out to be the best thing for them. That's the question. Discuss two Bible characters who experienced severe adversity, but it turned out to be the best thing for them. Just two, okay? You don't have to make a long list, just two. All right, so if you would, I'm going to give you five minutes. Please get into groups of three. Ideally, find somebody you're not related to and talk and f figure that out. Thank you. I'd like to hear from a, a three groups. And please just keep them, keep them short. But I'd like to hear from one Bible character that you chose and what was the adversity and how did it turn out to be the best thing for them? Who would like to be a group that would like to share one person they came up with? Okay, Judy over here. Very good. And if they have the same one you do, you can choose another, another one for your group. Okay, Judy, what'd y'all come up with? Okay, we discussed Joseph. Okay. The adversity was that his <laughs> brothers, you know, took him, pretended they killed him and sold him to Egypt. And he ended up going to prison and all these things happening over and different. So it sounds pretty adverse, but he ended up being able to interpret a dream for the Pharaoh, and he put him in com command of uh, gathering all the the food yep. to storage before the famine, and ended up saving his family's life and being rejoined from later on. Unbelievable story. You kind of wonder, could Joseph see that when he was being pulled down behind wagons to Egypt as a sold slave. I mean, could he even comprehend it? I, I, you know, I mean, whew, that was a good one. I have a feeling a few other people probably chose Joseph. Did anybody else have somebody other than Joseph that they'd like to share? Okay, Graziella. Sure, and then Nancy, that'd be fine. We'll do those three, that'd be fine. Uh, it looks like oh, there's a- sorry. Are you guys having a little ad adversity in your group there? Okay. We thought of Esther because had her parents not died and she'd become an orphan, she wouldn't have gone to live with her cousin, wouldn't have become queen, and wouldn't have been able to save her people. I mean, talk about a, a worse situation that can't get much worse than that for Esther. And yet, yeah, j just amazing. Okay, Nancy. Well, we thought of uh, Joseph, too, and Job, and Jesus, but we also thought of Moses. You know, Moses, he was a prince, and then, like EJ said, he went to rags, and he had to go do sheep, and then he had to lead a motley crew out of Egypt, 
um, you know, he was leading the people to the promised land. And then out of his frustration, I mean, we all get frustrated, but hmm. he was the leader and he had um, more responsibility, I guess, because God told him he was not allowed to go to the promised land. Well, M Moses thought, no, I mean, I've led them through the wilderness all these years and I don't get to go into the promised land. But then God took him to heaven, <laughs> the promised land. Yeah, 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 I mean, <laughs> Sometimes I hear, thank you for sharing everyone. And I'm sure um, there were other good, good individuals you guys came up with. But, you know, some of these stories in the Bible almost seem surreal. A almost, uh, in a way, almost unbelievable if they weren't true. Um, and yet, these are the kind of stories that as we come to church, and as we share these types of stories with each other, and as we read about these stories, this is one of the reasons that I think is good for us to come to church, is to be reminded of these situations on a regular basis. Because, guess what? We all have adversity. All of us. Every single person in this room has adversity. And if you haven't had a lot of adversity yet, you're just not old enough, okay? Because it'll come. It will come. And sometimes it comes like at the very bottom, little, little tiny adversity, just with a tiny little A, little, you know, we probably experience quite a bit of that, oftentimes even on a regular basis. Small, tiny little adversities, this breaks down, this doesn't work, this, you know, somebody cut me off in traffic, somebody, you know, just all this kind of stuff. Oh, I'm, I'm you know, um, I'm getting another call from a caller telemarketer, you know, that kind of adversity. Little teeny little annoying adversities that like, why are these people calling me? You know, those kinds. But there's other times where things are like big adversities. Big, big, big adversity, right? So let's think about that. The worst thing that happens to you may be the best thing for you if you don't let it get the best of you, okay? So I would like to suggest today that there's two camps we can live in when we, let, let's think of this, two communities we can reside in in our minds when adversity comes. And I could tell you personally, at least my personal experience, I actually oftentimes flip-flop between these, okay? Generally when adversity first comes in, I don't think about, oh, this is, this is good, this is better, this is good. No, no, it's generally what? Bitter. It's generally sadness. It's generally, why did I do this? Why did I let this happen? How did this happen to me? Why did that person say that to me? Why did, right? All this kind of stuff that's going around. Anybody here understanding this? Have you ever experienced it? Sure, we've all experienced it, right? I mean, there's maybe a health issue. Or, I mean, all these kind of things. Adversity, adversity. And so what I'd like to think of, of these letters is just look at these. These letters, these, these, these words are exactly the same except for one letter. There's one small little teeny letter difference. But they're worlds apart, aren't they? They're worlds apart. They're totally opposite in a lot of ways. Bitter or better. So, which town would you rather live in? Would you like to live in Bitterville? Or would you like to live in Betterville? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, you maybe have told you this story about one time when Vivian and I, this was when the kids were very small. In fact, maybe, yeah, they were very small. We were back in Texas still, and we bought some property in a town in Texas, a little country town. It's just, it was more of a, uh, not really a town. It was just a spot out in the country. And the name of the town was Ding Dong. Ding Dong, Texas. You've heard that, Dan, haven't I? I've told you that story before. And I, I was just dreaming of the day. We were planning on building a house there. And I was just dreaming of the day where I'd be able to tell people. They go, where are you from? Oh, I'm from Ding Dong, Texas. I was loving, I was wanting to be called a Ding Donger. You know, I just, I just was just, I could have so much fun with that whole thing about Ding Dong. And well, 
for a, for a variety of reasons, we ended up selling the property, never built a house, and I never actually lived in Ding Dong, Texas. It's one of the biggest adversity things that's happened to me in my life. I'm, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. But we never did live there. But think about this, Betterville, nobody wants to say, oh, I'm from Bitter, I'm, I'm from Bitterville. Yeah, oh, Bitterville, yeah. And how's that working for you? How do you like it when you're living in Bitterville? Yeah, no, nobody wants to live in Bitterville, but. But, but what happens? We all too often reside in Bitterville. We actually pour our foundation there and build our structure there. But that's not where God wants us to live. He doesn't want us to live in Bitterville. He wants us to live in Betterville. Now, don't get the wrong, um, well, let me ask this question. Which one is our natural default when it comes to adv adversity? Which one? Bitter? Are you saying bitter with an I? Yeah, right, bitter. That's our default, isn't it? We, we just, boom, we go right there. It's just, I mean, we don't even have to think about it. We're in Bitterville in no time flat, correct? All right, however, what if the possibility exists that we may temporarily reside in Bitterville, but we choose to more permanently res reside in Betterville. And how can we do that? And how does that even work? So, Aubrey Seiler, oh there you are. I had Aubrey come up, I wanted her to just share a little story. We're kind of a little late, so short if you can, okay? Very good. Well, not too short, but. On the screen, you see three men in white suits. These are official NASA astronauts, Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee. They had been a part of the Apollo program since the start. The Apollo program was the third in a line of programs to put a man on the moon. We had Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo, these astronauts had been serving for multiple years with a relatively new department of the government called the National Aeronautics Space Agency, I think, or something close to that, NASA. This is January 27, 1967, about a year and a half before Neil Armstrong walked on the moon, Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee were in the command module on top of the Apollo rocket at Cape Canaveral in Florida. It was a test. They were to be the first men to fly the Apollo rockets to space on February 21. This test they had to pass in order to make that February 21 date a reality. They had been sitting in the cockpit for quite some time as they were troubleshooting through different things. There was no fuel in the rocket. This is what some would call a routine test. They did not anticipate any issues with the test. Around 6.01, I think, in the evening, January 27, they heard over the communication wires, we have a fire in the cockpit. Uh, command module, I think, is actually the terminology they used. And within a matter of five minutes, Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee were dead in what was the first loss of life in the space program for the United States. This tragedy paused the space program for about 20 months, which was quite a long time as they were scrambling to figure out what was going on. There was a lot of pressure from Congress and the United States people about whether or not it was worth the risk to put a man on the moon So this would be considered a rather significant adversity for the space program. 
well, we know how history ended. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walked on the moon before the end of the decade, 1969, and were preceded by, I believe, 17 other men who walked on the moon over the course of multiple missions, which concluded um, sometime, I think, in 1970-something. The result of this accident was a redesign of the command module and a redesign of how NASA handled emergencies situations, how NASA handled safety issues. Um, Apollo 1 made it a better program and actually made it safer and more sustainable to send men into space and to the moon and to really, in a lot of ways, change the entire path of how we thought about our relation to things much bigger than ourselves. Now, nobody was happy that this happened. Adversity isn't necessarily a good thing. It's like what we do with adversity. Okay, here's the thing. People could be bitter about this. I'm sure a lot of people were bitter about this for a long time. But once adversity happens, you can't put adversity back in the box. It's like toothpaste. You get toothpaste out of the tube, you can't get it back in. So no matter how hard you try, no matter how hard you think, no matter how much you wish it would have never happened, you can't change it. But what can you do? You can make it better. I hope you don't get the wrong impression here. I'm not an advocate that adversity is always the right thing to do and happen. Now, we will talk a little bit about adversity here in just a minute, about from a biblical perspective. And there's our reasons for adversity to happen, to help change us, to help mold us, to help chisel us in the right way. But regardless of the adversity, it can always be something better if you decide to go and live in Betterville. Because let me ask you, how much does it help us to live in Bitterville? What's that gonna do for your health? What's it gonna do for your relationships? What's it gonna do for just how we see everyday life? What's that gonna do for us? Bitter really doesn't do much of anything for us other than making us miserable. So the thought about bitter versus better, which town would you rather live in? Because you're living there in your mind, right? We all know this. Guys, I'm not here to tell you I don't feel bitter about certain things. There's things that have happened to me and in our family that are very bad adversities, very bad, okay? And I look at them, I don't look at them with joy necessarily, but I do look at them as like, what good can come out of that? And believe it or not, there's almost always something good. What happened to those three astronauts was a tragedy, it was a terrible adversity, but it actually helped protect other people's lives down the road. Um, so, I want us to think about this. This is a quote I, saw, I found online. I was reading some stuff. I thought it was quite good. Adversity is God's way of getting our attention. Quote, adversity can be a, our greatest motivation for spiritual growth or our deadliest means of discouragement. It's going to happen. One, it's going to do one of the two. It's gonna do one of the two. The difference depends on our understanding of God's purposes through adversity. Now, I'd like to, um, I'm gonna not do this. I was gonna have you guys read them for me, but we're running a little late on time, and so I'm just gonna go through these rather quickly, but these are, in my mind, five wonderful texts to help us deal with adversity better, okay? Number one. 
found in Hebrews 12, 7 through 11. But God's discipline is always good for us so that we might share in his holiness. No discipline is enjoyable while it is happening. It's painful. But afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in his way. Number two, therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. That's an encouraging text. Number three, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Number four, very familiar one, oftentimes I think misunderstood, uh, but uh, here we go. Number four, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Romans 8, 28. And number five, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy to bear, and the, and the burden I give you is light. I mean, just think about that first sentence. Doesn't it just ooze comfort? Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Jesus is the one who gives us rest. No one understands adversity like Jesus. No one understands adversity like Jesus. How many? No one. Okay? Think about it. I mean, anyway, we don't have time to get into it, but just, just think. No one understands a verse like Jesus. He healed the one who arrested him. Served the one who betrayed him. And loved the world who crucified him. That's what Jesus does with adversity. Mm. How is that possible? Where do you want to live? Bitterville or Betterville? When we experience adversity, it's important to have a good friend. Friendships help. And there's no better friend than Jesus. So, we're going to have our closing song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Please bow your heads with me. Lord, we, we, we deep down inside know it's not good for us to live in Bitterville. And yet we find it hard to really know maybe how to live in Betterville. And yet, you are a great example. Jesus is the answer. And that as we draw closer to him, he helps us as well. So I just pray that when we're feeling bitter, that that will signal us to connect to Jesus, understanding that no one understands adversity like he does. We thank you for being our God, for being our Savior, and being our friend. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.